Eight Pillars of Prosperity by James Allen. James Allen is known for a book, As a Man Thinketh, which in my opinion is one of the most powerful personal development books ever written, and one of the oldest. If you haven't read it, it's available in public domain, as with this book, so I'm going to put a link in the description, and for the video I did on As a Man Thinketh. And in this book, we're going to talk about the eight pillars, the eight pillars that were covered. And we're going to go into detail within each of them. And it's important to understand that the underlying principle behind James Allen's philosophy in As a Man Thinketh, and in this book, is that you become what you think about. How you believe reality to work is going to determine the thoughts you have, the emotions that you have, the actions or lack of actions that you take, and inevitably the results that you get. And while there are things beyond your control, you have far more ability to influence that which is within your control, which is about 99.9% .9 of the elements. And all we have to do is increase our awareness and recognize that there's a lot of things we're just not looking at. As Jay Abraham puts it, the answer is always in front of your face. The problem is you just don't see it. The first pinnacle belief you have to have is faith in the possibility that you can make it happen. By having faith, you go to work to look in areas where other people would not look, to recognize that success is a consciousness. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of navigating reality. Some of us have success consciousness, and some of us have failure consciousness. The consciousness that you're going to have is going to largely determine the success or lack thereof you're going to achieve. So we're going to talk about these important eight pillars here, which is going to further drive your understanding of success consciousness. And then the important recognition that if you want to achieve success in whatever area of your choice, business, personal development, relationships, friendships, supporting the community, giving back, whatever your meaning of success is, these principles right here will shift the way you think into one of abundance consciousness, raising your consciousness up to the higher levels of consciousness where true power exists. Maybe we talked about this in the power versus first force video. In lower states of consciousness, we use force and we confuse that with power. Higher level consciousness does not integrate force. There is no force. You act from a place of interdependence, okay, working with people. You don't need to take away from people to get what you want. You share, you combine, you work together, you partner with others to get what you want and what they want, and oftentimes at a higher level than if you didn't do the partnership. That's how it works in the higher states of consciousness. So our goal is to raise our consciousness and to eliminate any kind of macro and micro based scarcity consciousness. And that's what we're going to talk about in this video. We're going to shift the way we think and we're going to elevate ourselves as a result of discussing these principles, as a result of watching this video, and as a result of really, really paying attention to how we respond based on what we're going to discuss right here. We have within us the ability right now to raise our consciousness to that of higher levels of success, success consciousness. Prosperity rests upon a moral function. It is properly supposed to rest upon an immoral function, okay? lower states of consciousness, that is, upon trickery, sharp practice, deception, and greed. One commonly hears even an otherwise intelligent man declare that no man can be successful in business unless he is dishonest. Thus, regarding business prosperity, a good thing, as the effect of dishonesty, a bad thing. You see, there exists today far more opportunity than has ever existed before. Okay, we talked about this in the discussion I did on Evan Pagan's book, Opportunity. I'll put a link in the description. In order to be able to work with the new opportunity that is a net result of the raised consciousness of those that have raised the consciousness, we have to align ourselves with that thought process, that vibration, that consciousness 
and then we'll be able to see the opportunity and execute upon it. And in those levels, the higher levels, there is no need. In fact, if you were to do it, if you were to do deception, if you were to be greedy, and if you were to take advantage of others and you would apply trickery, and manip manipulation, you wouldn't be able to work with it. I mean, think about this for a moment. If you want to get access to the abundant opportunity that exists at the higher states of consciousness, perish the thought that any kind of business practice needs to be done with deception and greed and trickery. First pillar is energy. Energy is a moral virtue. It's opposing vice being laziness. As a virtue, it can be cultivated and the lazy man can become energetic by forcefully allowing himself to exertion. Okay, so the, what we're really talking about here is taking action, applying what we're learning. We don't want to just think about all these things and become conceptual. In order to influence reality, we have to do just that. We have to apply. We have to take action. We have to develop willpower. Remember I talked about the four things, focus of will, level of awareness purity of intent, and quality of character? Well, focus of will is developed by taking action, doing what you have to do, whether you feel like it or not, until you cultivate the joy and passion, knowing that it is a virtuous action that is going to lead, maybe even in the short term, medium term, long term, to a fruitful reward. And this is cultivated. Okay, This willpower, how you do one thing is how you do everything. When you apply it to business, it'll be easier to apply it to health, fitness, relationships. Self-discipline and the ability to take action and to have a bias towards taking action is something that can be cultivated through taking action, only through taking action, not by talking about it. And the results is abundance, higher levels of consciousness. Those that achieve higher levels of consciousness have taken action to get to the higher levels of consciousness. And as a result of that, they have access to those opportunities that are even more abundant at those higher states of consciousness. Thus, they will get even more success. Hence the saying, a person gets a certain level of success. Everything they then touch turns to gold. But energy is a composite power. It does not stand alone. Involved in it are qualities which go to making of vigorous character and the production of prosperity. Mainly these qualities are contained in the four following characteristics. Number one, promptitude. Promptitude. Promptitude is valuable possession. It begets reliability. People who are alert, prompt, and punctual are relied upon. They can be trusted to do their duty and do it vigorously as well. So people who are alert, prompt, and punctual are relied upon. In other words, they're valued. If you're a person that is alert, ready to take action, quick decision maker, and takes action in a timely manner, show up to meetings on time, be respectful towards that other person, be alert and present when you're having a conversation, whether it's in personal, relationship, and business, you are practicing being prompt, promptitude. And if you don't do it, then what's going to happen? Well, you're not working with the energies. You're not cultivating that important willpower that needs to be cultivated. And as a, as a result of it, you're leaving your success probably up to chance. And you're not going to get access to the opportunities at the higher states of consciousness. Because those opportunities are for those that are punctual, that are rely upon. They're the ones that have that value in that area. Vigilance, number two. Vigilance is the guard of all the faculties and powers of the mind. It is the detective that prevents the entrance of any violent and destructive element. It is the close companion and protector of all success, liberty, and wisdom. Without this watchful attitude of mind, a man is a fool, and there is no prosperity for a fool. The idea here is you have to protect your mind. The information that goes into your mind is influencing the energy that you have. It's mixing with your energy. When you're around energy that is negative, it's mixing with you. Now, this doesn't mean you can't be around negative energy, but you got to be aware of the impacts and you got to know how to deal with it. 
if you have to deal with negative situations or negative people because that's what's required to move forward, recognize that you've taken that energy within yourself. And then you have to do processes. You have to do some clearing exercises. You have to do some meditation. Because if you don't, you're going to dump that energy on other people and people are not going to want to be around you. You have to learn how to clear yourself. And if you can't handle that, if you can't do that, you might want to ask yourself, why are you placing yourself in those situations where you absorb that energy? Why are you being so careless and being disrespectful to the people that you serve by bringing them negative energy? Industry. Industry brings cheerfulness and plenty. Vigorously industrious, industrious people are the happiest members of community. They're not always the richest. If by riches is meant a super fluidity of money, but they're always the most lighthearted and joyful and the most satisfied with what they do and have and are therefore the richer if by richer we mean more abundantly blessed. Okay? Industry brings cheerfulness and plenty. People that contribute, okay, create value for others, entrepreneurs, real value, not hypothetical value, not what you think is valuable from an egotistical perspective, but rather what is valuable to the marketplace what they're going to take up money and buy. They're going to exchange if you're interested in barter. Value for value, and money is just a bridge for that value. It's just a means in which you can exchange value. They work for their money, and they give you their money, which is hard-earned, to provide value for them, to them reinvesting it back in themselves. They're taking the money, giving it to you to take your value to reinvest back in themselves. So they can create more value. value. Value for themselves, value for their community, value for those that they serve, their office place if they have a job, the factory if they work in a factory, their family, their friends, and so forth. That's what he's talking about when he's saying industry. It's the recognition of value. And that those that are vigorously industrious are the happiest members of community because they support others. They create products that are needed and useful and beneficial. And as a result of it, they're rewarded greatly. And they're abundantly blessed, not just with money, but in all areas of your life. People who make themselves useful to the community receive back from the community their full share of health, happiness, and prosperity. One of the big themes of James Allen's work, especially in As a Man Thinketh, is you will always get what you put out. Whatever energy you put out, Whatever actions you take, there is a specific response for that. And if you're not getting enough value back, then you're probably not creating enough value. Consider that to be an opportunity for you to really sit down and really evaluate what you're doing. And ask yourself. Be real. Okay? Look at yourself in the mir mirror. And don't see the facade. Be real. And really ask yourself, is what you're doing valuable for others? Are you really contributing to the community? Because if you are, then prosperity comes back to you in its equivalent. Nothing more, nothing less. That's how it works. Those that acquire a lot of wealth have figured out creative ways to work with the laws and the energies to multiply their value and provide more value in greater quantity of value, greater quality of value, and multiple aspects of value that might not be something that you see but that their clients and those that they give value to experience and they're rewarded greatly and a lot of times not necessarily from their clients but from various other sources because whatever you put out comes back to you. They brighten the daily task and keep the world moving. Okay? Industry people keep the world moving. They are the gold of the nation and the salt of the earth. Earnestness. Earnestness. Earnestness, said a great teacher, is the path of immortality. They, are who, they who are in earnest do not die. They who are not in earnest are as if dead already. Earnestness is the dedication of the entire man, mind to its task. Okay? The entire mind to its task. We live only in what we do. Earnest people are dissatisfied with anything short of the highest excellence in whatever they do. And they always reach that excellence. 
Okay, one of my favorite movies, Hero Dreams of Sushi. Put a link in the description of the trailer. I recommend you watch that movie. I also did the video on the book on extreme ownership. If you haven't watched that, I'll put a link in the description. Now, when you're saying dissatisfied, it doesn't mean having a low self-esteem, kind of not valuing yourself, but rather always aiming higher, always figuring out if you can create value for others, how can you create even more value? If you do a job, how can I do it even better? Even if others around don't take it seriously. I remember when I was growing up, I used to work in a lot of factories when I was 16, 17 years old. It was the only kind of places that would hire me because I didn't really have the experience or the ability to communicate and articulate my value. And I didn't really have much skill, so you know there wasn't a lot of concrete value I can create for others because I didn't acquire the skills. But one thing I did when I was in this factory, I remember thinking this to myself because I remember reading Magic of Thinking Big and reading books and listening to Tony Robbins. And one of the themes was always like Jim Rohn is that if you want to get success, you got to help others get success. And I would say to myself, what do I got? And all I had was this, you know, working on a production line. And I said to myself that I was going to do the best job over there. I was going to be the fastest. I was going to be the most efficient. I was going to look for better ways. And I was going to see that as an opportunity to grow. And as a result of it, I learned logistics. I learned aspects of the business. I earned the respect of people in the company that were leaders, managers, and they would share with me valuable golden nugget based insights that was all based on their experience and wisdom that they acquired. And I parlayed that into later stages in my life. No matter where you are right now, the lesson is this, no matter where you are right now, you can do the best that you can with what you have. And to become passionate in what you're doing right now stays with you when you do something that you want to do later on. And it's a habit that is built upon those early stages. Wherever you are, whether shopkeeper or saintly teacher, you can safely give the very best of the world without any doubt or misgiving. If the indelible impress of your earnestness be on your goods in one case or on your words in the other, your business will flourish or your percepts will live or your precepts will live. Now, again, talking about what we were mentioning, it doesn't matter what you do. What you put out comes back to you in some shape or form. It may not come back right away, could come back in a later stage. But if it comes back and you get 24 hours and within that 24 hours, you can maximize your output, you can do more with what you have, why wouldn't you just do that? You're making an investment with every thought and action that you take. And seeing everything you do as an investment is going to allow you to bring out that earnestness, allow you to bring out the vigilance, the promptitude. And that's what we're talking about when we're saying energy, specifically directing your mind and energy towards a specific worthwhile ideal. As Neural Nightingale says, success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. It is both the journey and the end result. And when you get the end result, you got to raise the bar higher. That is life. That's how you keep moving. And if you don't move, you're dying. Second pillar, economy. Nature destroys every foulness, not by annihilation, but by transmutation, by sweetening and purifying it and making it serve the ends of things beautiful, useful, and good. Nature works this way. We see it as bad. And when things happen, we're like this person's bad or what they do is bad and this is bad and whatever. Practice acceptance. At the higher states of consciousness, you accept people for who they are. Seek first to understand. You don't know why people do the things that they do. You don't realize fully the extent of the impact of a person and their life and what they need to learn and what they're going to contribute at a later stage of their life. The best thing you could do is accept that nature has a plan. This is the thought process of the higher states of consciousness because then you can focus on what you have control over. Granted, 
there's a thousand different things that you could do every minute. Tens of thousands, millions of thousands of millions of things. But what are you doing? And what you're doing should have an impact on some result. But you could do this or you could do something else. What is the highest and best use? When you recognize that there's foulness and whatever, understand something. That stuff is going to be taken care of. Okay, what people put out as far as foulness comes back to them. Always, in some shape or form. And sometimes you might have to take action. And sometimes you might not have to take action. That depends. But nature destroys every foulness with time. And our role is to recognize economy. Recognizing that you have time, energy, resources, and opportunity cost. And how do you work with these things? How do you work with the assets if you're in business? The pillar of economy when sadly built, will be found to be composed largely of these four qualities. Number one, moderation. Moderation is the strong core of economy. It avoids extremes, finding the middle way in all things. It also consists in abstaining from the unnecessary and the harmful. There can be no such thing as moderation in that which is evil, for that would be excess. So we're talking about right here, economy. We're dealing with our time, energy, opportunity, costs, and resources, and we got to be able to work with these elements in various configurations without being of excess, without wasting. Okay, think of if you are making a dinner, would you buy an excess amount of whatever ingredients only to not have any storage and end up throwing it away? Or would you buy just the right amount? seems obvious like you would just buy the right amount. Well, this is to be exercised in everything we do. Moderation. How much do we really need to produce the end result? One of my favorite concepts from the 4-Hour Workweek by Timothy Ferris, and I did a discussion on that, I'll put a link in the description, is he talks about in there, is that a lot of times to create this ideal lifestyle that you want, you don't actually have to go out and make a whole ton of money. You don't. You just have to reverse engineer. Figure out exactly how much money you need to pay for the life experiences that you want. And then also recognize there's alternative ways of getting those life experiences. For example, an app like Turo. A couple weeks ago, I rented a Porsche. Would I go out and buy a Porsche? Maybe in the future. Right now, it's not of interest. But I'm in LA right now, and it's a lot of fun. I can drive it around, enjoy it, and I'll just give it back. Do I need a Porsche all year round? Well, I also travel a lot. And perhaps if I had a Porsche sitting for five or six months, not doing anything, I guess I could put it on Turo and rent it out. But that's, you know, opening up another can of entrepreneurship, but we're not going to go there. But the question really is that what do we really need as far as resources to have the experiences that we need? And in context of creating prosperity, in context of creating success, how much resources do we need to fulfill, to bring us the joy, to give us life experiences, to stimulate us so that we can be of more service, so we can live a life of fulfillment plus a life of service? And a lot of times, it's far less than we actually think. Because today, and you know, I was talking about Turo, the same is to be true with Airbnb. You can rent nice properties around the world, beautiful properties. Or you could rent something, let's say you're going to work for one month and you're not interested in throwing parties and having all kinds of people over and doing the social thing. You just want to work. You could rent a small room in some city in a town or in a, in a country that's not as much to live in and you can focus on your work right there, keeping your overhead really low, make a bunch of money and then go out and rent a nicer place, rent a nicer car, have experiences. Think today, as I mentioned this earlier, there's far more opportunity for creating wealth. But there's also far more opportunity to not necessarily use your money, but work with the various kinds of apps that are available to rent, to borrow, to barter, to trade, to have those experiences. You have within you, yes, money as a resource, time as a resource, energy as a resource, 
and all the different kinds of assets. And if you haven't watched the video I did, the last video I did, I talked about all the different kinds of assets that are available if you are involved with business, for example, that a lot of times we didn't really know existed. But we could work with all of them utilizing the concept of economy and moderation to create really amazing life experiences, but not just that, to create more value for others. Moderation is very important. And how you do one thing is how you do everything. Moderation in entertainment, moderation in pleasure, moderation in the food that you eat, moderation in your business, not spending excessively, moderation in your energy, efficiency. Efficiency proceeds from the right conservation of one's forces and powers. All skills is the use of concentrated energy. Superior skill as talent and genius is a higher degree of concentrated force. Men are always skillful in that which they love because the mind is almost ceaselessly centered upon it. Skill is the result of that mental economy which transmutes thought into invention and action. Okay. Efficiency, very related to moderation. We want to become efficient. We want to be resourceful. We can talk about that in a moment. But it's really concentrating energy. Okay. Energy of the mind, energy of working with the mind and the assets that you have, the different opportunities that you have, and doing it efficiently. One of the things that I always do when I work with my clients is I look and say, how many steps are they taking to get the end result that they want? How much resources are they using? Time, energy, opportunity, costs, money, different assets, human resources, and so forth. How much are they using to get this end result? And why do they have all these steps in place? Are they masquerading being busy with accomplishment? Do they think that just by doing a whole bunch of steps that that's the only way to get that result? Do they think that by working with the current configuration that they have right now, which is wasteful, that's the only way? Maybe they don't even see it as wasteful. Maybe they see it as resourcefulness. And it's time for me to reevaluate and help them recognize that there's better ways of doing things, requiring less steps. One of my favorite software tools is Trello. It's just a web-based software. And it's a project management tool. And the easiest way to grow your business if you have a product or service that you are offering, is to go out and get clients, you get sales. Peter Drucker talks about this, marketing and innovation. And I group sales under marketing in this instance. All the other things that you do are expenses. And the question we want to ask ourselves is, and I've heard Damon John say this one time, and I, you know, I want to do a discussion on his book, Power, Power of Broke. He said, one of the things that he always thinks about is, what's the fastest route to the money? What's the fastest route? If we're going to do something, if we're going to build a business and we found our niche and we found our product, we found our service, why do we create all these complex steps? One of the things that happens is then if you focus on the fastest route to the money and you acquire the money, now you've got capital, which is a resource that you can reinvest back. But if you take a long convoluted route to the money, then you're burning away at your capital. You're burning away at your energy, and the worst of all, you're wasting your time. Resourcefulness. Resourcefulness is the outcome of efficiency. It is an important element in prosperity. For the resourceful man is never confounded. He may have many falls, but he will always be equal to the occasion, and he will be on his feet again immediately. Resourcefulness has its fundamental cause in the conservation of energy. It is energy transmuted. When a man cuts off certain mental and bodily vices, which have been depleting him of his energy, what becomes of the energy so conserved? It is not destroyed or lost, for energy can never be destroyed or lost. It becomes productive energy. It reappears in the form of fruitful thought. The virtuous man is always more successful than the vicious man because he is teeming with resources. So the goal is to work with what you have right now, resourcefulness, based on what we've discussed. 
and what we've been discussing on all the videos that I've shared. And then as you acquire more resource, whether that be money or access to people where you could do barter, joint venture partnerships, relationships, and so forth, forth, is to work with those resources with the same focus and magnitude that you had when you had limited resources. The other day I met a new friend and we were talking about resourcefulness. We both come from very humble beginnings and he was able to build a very successful company. If you're watching this video, Ivan, what's up? Very young man, 22 years old, built a very successful company in Toronto, sold it, made a good deal of money, and we hung out and we were talking about how we came from humble beginnings and one of the greatest things that we learned was to work with what we have. And as a result of it, when we grew to higher levels, we were still resourceful. Not cheap, but resourceful. And as a result of it, this whole world opened up to us. Possibilities and opportunities and all kinds of cool configurations came as a result of valuing that now we have access to more resources, not just ours, but the networks and connections we've built. And we can be more resourceful than ever before because resourcefulness can keep increasing. But because we have access to all these resources in our networks, we're a lot more valuable to them, partners, strategic alliances. We're more valuable to them than others who have never been in a situation where they would have to practice resourcefulness. Not This doesn't mean you have to be born in a humble family, early beginnings of you know, humbleness. You don't have to be born like that. You can practice it right now with what you have. But you have to value it. You have to make a decision that I don't need any more. I've got everything that I have right now. And with what I have right now, I'm going to create something. And I'm going to incrementally acquire more resources. And throughout the process, I'm going to look for creative ways of working with those resources. It's a fun puzzle, and it's very exciting once you develop a passion for doing it. Because arguably, it's one of the most valuable skills you can have in life. Everything we do as entrepreneurs, as those that are responsible for the well-being of others by value creation, even if you're not an entrepreneur, is working with resources to create the results physical resources, mental resources, emotional resources within yourself, within your sphere of influence, within those that you are connected with and their sphere of influence. That's why it's so important to value a book like Extreme Ownership because in that book, we're not just talking about building yourself up and being resourceful within yourself, but scaling that to others, taking ownership, building teams and infusing them with the spirit of resourcefulness. Number four, originality. Originality is resourcefulness ripened and perfected. Where there is originality, there is genius. And men of genius are the lights of this world. Whatever work a man does, he should fall back upon his own resources in doing it. While learning from others, he should not slavishly imitate them, but should put himself into his work and so make it new and original. Look for inspiration. Good book I did a discussion on is Steal Like an Artist by Austin Kleon. There's nothing new under the sun. Even this information that we're talking about here was pulled from spiritual texts. All the personal development business books that you've seen come from earlier sources. It's just presented in a different way. It's just adding a little twist, more depth, more dimension, maybe a different perspective of looking at things. When you're able to pick up like the periodic table of elements, the part that make up the whole, you're able to create cool new configurations that seem u- unique. And so it's important to be inspired by others. But it's also important to follow your heart, as Steve Jobs talked about. And that's why I really enjoy the book, Autobiography of the Yogi. Okay, now the video is becoming pretty popular. I did it a few weeks ago. I'll watch a, I mean, I'll put a link in the description. I recommend you watch it. Because that was the one book that Steve Jobs would read over and over again. And for the last 40 years of his life, he would read it every year. And was taught to be the only book that he had on his iPhone or iPad. And when you go through a book like that, you recognize that the power is within yourself. 
you have access to what Napoleon Hill calls infinite intelligence. And you can draw upon this inner knowing and understanding. Be inspired by others, but don't be a copycat for them. Be inspired for them. Model after them. I'm a huge fan of modeling. A lot of who I am today is best practices based on those that I learned from, my mentors, and those that I aspired to be like. And they had varying qualities. Some were very resourceful. Some were great communicators. Some had an amazing way of looking at reality. Some were very uplifting and inspiring. Some were a lot of fun. You know, I just looked around and I said, what are all the bits and pieces that I can learn from different people? I got in contact with them. I worked for them. I hired them as mentors. I did business deals with them. And I learned from them. And I integrated what I learned from them into who I am, which is original. And so now when you look at the work that I do on this channel, it can appear to be very original. There isn't any hour, you know, two hour video long discussions on insights and perspectives on books that are built on mind maps that articulate my personality, but not because I want to articulate my personality to impress you, but because I'd rather use this format, which is pure, real to who I am, to share with you all this information to benefit you. This is how I've learned to share in a way that helps others create behavioral change. Again, we're talking about real value. But going back to the higher point, that's an element of economy. Number three is integrity. The man that courts prosperity must in all his transactions, whether material or mental, study how to give a just return for that which he receives. So this is about fairness. Okay? This is about not trying to take advantage of people and getting the upper hand. That's done in lower states of consciousness. We're talking about higher states of consciousness based opportunities, based entrepreneurship, based success. And in the higher states of consciousness, and if you haven't watched Power versus Force, you've got to study the levels of consciousness. I thought he did a great job conceptualizing it. 200 and above is where power, real power, occurs. Not mixed with force, not mixed with trickery, none of that. And so what we want to do is we want to work from that perspective, with that level of consciousness. And that's all about valuing yourself, understanding again, the strategy of preeminence by Jay Abraham. And that you would not disservice somebody by giving them mediocre products, mediocre service. You wouldn't do that. Because if you were to put that out, what you would get is mediocrity. If you were to put that out and take advantage of somebody now, it's going to come back to you later. It always does. The pillar of integrity is held together by these four elements. Number one is honesty. Honesty is the surest way to success. The day at last comes when the dishonest man repents in sorrow and suffering. But no man ever needs to repent of having been honest. Even when the honest man fails, as he does sometimes, through lacking other of these principles such as energy, economy, or systems, his failure is not the grievous thing that is to the dishonest man, for he can always rejoice in the fact that he has never defrauded a fellow being. Even in his darkest hour, he finds repose in a clear conscience. Clarity of mind is very important. The ability to think, the ability to reflect, will allow you to determine the course of action. If you cloud your mind with dishonesty, and it eats away at your conscience. You won't be able to think clearly. And when you can't think clearly, how are you going to find the most efficient way to produce the result? How are you going to find the quickest, effective, fastest path, ethically, towards the money? If you don't live with honesty, and this is an ongoing journey, because maybe if you come from different backgrounds, like I did, and I'm talking to my friend about this in earlier stages, you didn't have access to people that would teach you these kind of things that we learned through our mentors. A lot of people at the lower states of consciousness thought that people at higher states were dishonest. 
They thought that people that had a lot of money were evil. I know a lot of people that have money, and all of them that I know. Now, not to say that people who all people who have a lot of money are are angels, but all the people that I know that I've met, my friends who've acquired a lot of business success and as a result wealth, strive to improve and refine their honesty. They become more and more honest. And as a result of that, they're able to do better business deals. If they ask somebody for a high amount for a product or service that they're selling, the other person will say yes because they can receive the honesty and integrity in the communication. They don't need to trick somebody or strong arm them into buying. They communicate because they know how to find the right people who are actually looking for that product or service. And if the market does not exist for that, they'll find something else to sell or create. Fearlessness. Fearlessness. Fearlessness accompanies honesty. The honest man has a clear eye and an unflinching gaze. He looks his fellow men in the face and his speech is direct and convincing. The liar and the cheat hangs his head. His eyes is muddy and his gaze oblique. He cannot look another man in the eye and his speech arouses mistrust for it is ambiguous and unconvincing. If you're honest and you really believe in what you have to offer, if you believe your product or service is of value, then what is there to fear? The only thing that will happen is if you don't target your market properly is you'll be talking with people that are not interested and they'll reject you. And if you're afraid of rejection because of that, you got to learn to perish the thought because they're not rejecting you because they dislike you. They're just saying that that's not for them. They're giving you objective data. If you understand the principles of direct response marketing, then you'll recognize how to target people that are actually interested. And not only are they looking for what you have to offer, provided that that need actually exists in the marketplace, but when you interact with them, when you so-called sell them on the idea, you didn't really sell them on the idea where they were looking for that. And they're just happy to do the transaction with you. It's a very straightforward process, and there's nothing to fear. Purposefulness. Purposefulness is the direct outcome of that strength of character which integrity fosters. The man of integrity is a man of direct aims, and strong and intelligent purpose. What's the purpose that you have? One of my favorite models is the DILTS model. I talked about it in a number of videos. Aligning what you do with who you are, your vision, and on top, the highest. What's your purpose? Create a purpose. I'll share with you mine. My purpose is to create products and services as an entrepreneur that are needed and useful that contribute to people's lives, in which I get rewarded for that in monetary ways or other returns on that investment that I make. And those products and services are designed to enrich in lives, improve lives in various shapes or forms. And as a result of that, I grow and I help others get value. And as a result of that, I further evolution as far as the species go, and I perform work for a higher purpose, that of the evolution of others. And in the process while I'm doing those things, I'm enjoying it. I'm having fun because like you, I'm a huge fan of personal development and I like to grow. And I like to inspire others that grow. And I love connecting with people who grow and are passionate. The other day I was talking about how I met Ivan we hung out till 3 o'clock in the morning at Redondo Beach, and we were just talking. We were just sitting there and talking. We were just talking about life, business stories, different kinds of things. I love that kind of stuff. That's part of my journey. Okay, My journey is that. It gives my life a lot of meaning. I have a lot of purpose in my life. When you got purpose like that, it's very easy to determine what you want and what you don't want. And if you come across somebody that wants to do a deal with you, whatever shape or form, we're not just talking about business deals here. We're talking about relationships, dating, friendships. If they're not in alignment, then I'm not resentful or hateful towards them. I'm accepting of them. It's like, well, I accept you for who you are, what you want to do. But I'm interested in doing this. And if you want to do this and we can do it together, maybe there's some connects, yeah. But that's my, this is my purpose. And I don't want to do anything 
that pulls me away from my purpose. And it's not as serious as it sounds. This is a lot of fun. Invincibility. Invincibility. Invincibility is a glorious protector, but it only envelops the man whose integrity is perfectly pure and unassailable, never to violate, even in the most insignificant particular, the principle of integrity is to be invincible against all the assaults of innuendo, slander, and misrepresentation. Again, if you're real, if you're keeping it real and you know who you are, and you know that you're operating from a place of integrity and creating real value, and you're distributing that value, then if somebody were to say something to you, it's not going to bother you. Why would it bother you? What do you have to hide? If it bothers you, just reflect upon that and say, wait a second. I know I'm doing the right thing. And the reason why this person is so-called bothering me or irritating me is a test. It's a test. That's all it is of my congruence towards my purpose. And thank them. Thank them for giving you a test. And you don't have to argue with them. Remember, we talk about winning through our actions, not through our arguments. You don't need to have that discussion even. You just need to do the thing. That's what they're talking about here when we're talking about invincibility. When you're on purpose, you're moving. You're fearless because you're honest. That's what we're talking about when we're saying integrity. Now, I did a book discussion on speed of trust. I recommend watching that video. Yeah, I'll put a link in the description. If you want to further build the understanding of integrity, watch that video. And number two, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. Watch that video that I did. Fourth pillar is system. System. System is that particular of order by which confusion is rendered impossible. In the natural and universal order, everything, in, is, everything is in its place so that the vast universe runs more perfectly than the most perfect machine. Disorder in space would mean the destruction of the universe, and disorder in a man's affairs destroys his work and his prosperity. So we're talking about setting up systems here, and you know one of the best books in the business world when it comes to learning about systems at a foundational level, you're not talking about like Six Sigma and all that kind of stuff, we're talking about E-Myth Revisited, I did a discussion on that. Watch that book. If you're interested in systems, recognize that it's not a people's problem. It's a systems problem. As much as we want to blame people, and this was again talked about in extreme ownership, it's important that we resolve the system and we have control over resolving the system. You have a system. In system is contained these four ingredients. Number one is readiness. Readiness is aliveness. It is the spirit of alertness by which a situation is immediately grasped and dealt with. The observance of system fosters and develops the spirit. The successful general must have the power to readily meeting any new and unlooked or for move on the part of the enemy. So every businessman must have the readiness to deal with any unexpected development affecting his line of trade. And so also must the man of thought be able to deal with the details of any new problems which may arise. Okay, so the emphasis here is you've got to be ready to deal with the details of any problems which may arise. Those are opportunities. Anytime you move and take action towards your goals, a worthy ideal, you're going to experience things that move you forward. And you might experience things that might seem like a setback. Those are opportunities. And the focus and discipline and magnitude in which you work with those obstacles, that might seem like obstacles, to transmute them into opportunities is going to determine how fast you get success and the level of success you're going to get. For every opportunity, or I should say, for every obstacle overcome is the discovery of many opportunities. You will learn new ways of solving the problem. You will have life experiences that uncover more truths, more insights. You might have even cultivated friendships, relationships, business partners as a result of that obstacle. But to avoid it will result in nothing. And, you know, a perfect economy strategy. Pick and choose your battles. Pick and choose. 
but recognize if you do it with enough awareness and presence, okay, level of awareness, that every single problem that you have will not only give you a way of solving it, but alternative ways of solving it, how you could prevent it yourself from getting into that problem, proactiveness, how to take what you learned in that particular problem and apply it to somewhere else. It will increase your self-esteem and your self-confidence. And when you increase your self-esteem and your self-confidence, your communication skills improve. You see, there's so much value here in taking action. And we can go on on and on and on about the different elements of the value of taking action. But you got to be able to move quick so that you can learn faster. And the faster you learn, the faster you're going to achieve success. Accuracy. Accuracy is of supreme importance in all commercial concerns and enterprises. But there can be no accuracy apart from system. And a system which is more or less imperfect will ev evolve its originator in involve his originator in mistakes more or less disastrous until he improves it if you have a company you have a business look as an entrepreneur anything that i do as an entrepreneur i can start it out and i can keep improving it but there's always going to be weak areas it always gets better think of the most sophisticated gadget sophisticated app software there's always issues and those are opportunities to make it better, better and better and better. And the more we make it better, the faster we make it better, the less likely we're like going to have a disastrous thing that happens. But if we ignore it and we just let it slide and we just keep putting it off, when we have the time, energy, and resources and the opportunity cost to address it, then that's just a form of laziness. We talked about that earlier. Now, understandably so, we have time, energy, resources, assets, opportunity cost. And sometimes the business grows really fast and you can't address everything. There's no way you can address everything. And as a result of it, things will break. You know, look at Uber, for example. As Uber grew rapidly, there was all kinds of issues with Uber. You know, taxi companies were upset about the whole thing, legalities, customer service. There was a lot of different things. They did the best they could. And could they have done better? Well, I don't know how the organization works. Was there areas they needed to improve on? Of course. Every business has areas they can improve on. And the areas that we don't improve on is where the disasters happen. But don't let that be resulting in paralysis by analysis. Okay? So remember this. All truths are half-truths. So sometimes you got to move forward. And things got to break when it moves forward. That's how an entrepreneur does it. And that's why I love entrepreneurship. In entrepreneurship, we have a bias for taking action and moving forward and implementation. That's what an entrepreneur does. Later on, we'll bring on a CEO. Now, I'm very blessed because I learned ways of the CEO. I was mentored by high-level executives. And I learned the ways of an entrepreneur. And I was mentored by entrepreneurs. So I have a good balance and an appreciation for both. But that's what a CEO does is come into an organization and with such precision is able to see all the connects and dots and assign and align the teams and a structure. Again, Extreme Ownership, such a great book for CEOs. And implement and improve. But accuracy is very important. Number three is utility. Utility or usefulness is the direct result of method in one's work. Labor arrives at fruitful and profitable ends when it is systematically pursued. If the gardener is to gather in the best produce, he must not only sow that and plant, but he must sow and plant at the right time. And if any work is to be fruitful in results, it must be done seasonably. And the time for doing it, a thing must not be allowed to pass by. You know, we talked about that in the video, Opportunity is now and in the future, opportunities are going to increase, but the window to execute upon the opportunity before someone else does is smaller than ever before. Okay, really fast, that's because of emerging technologies. And we also talked about Uber being an emergent of a whole bunch of different technological breakthroughs in communication, physical technological breakthroughs, okay, like a phone and the advancement of the physical phone as well as software elements 
and different kinds of technologies that were integrated from a software perspective, plus needs and logistics and a whole bunch of different pieces, which created that opportunity in which they had executed upon. There's a lot of these that exist, more so than ever before. Now, I don't understand why anyone can't find a viable opportunity, personally. I mean, I understand why. Because when we don't understand the dynamics of what makes a viable opportunity, it's understandable to then realize that we're not looking in the right place. We're not thinking critically the right way for what is a viable opportunity. So I'll take that back and I say I do understand, but you know what I mean. There's more opportunity today than ever before if we just practice some critical thinking and recognize that with critical thinking and evaluation, opportunity is increasing but also uh, going away really fast. And if you miss an opportunity, don't worry about it. There's one right now. You can pause this video and you can go find another opportunity. In the various business transactions and deals that I'm involved with in configurations, most of you know right now my YouTube channel, my online training programs, and maybe some private coaching and consulting that I do in the, in the sphere of business and personal development and entrepreneurship training and cultivation. But you don't know about the other things that I do, the other businesses that I'm involved with, businesses have, that have nothing to do with any sort of personal development or business consulting or business operations or anything like that because I look at different opportunities I haven't executed upon them, but then there's even more. There's tons of prospective deals right now that I've been proposed. Real concrete money deals, okay? People will actually pay money for me to do these different kinds of deals. And I can't do it because of time, energy, resources, and opportunity costs. Yeah, I could hire more people and so forth, but there are other elements to the puzzle that you know I'm not going to get into a lengthy discussion on in this video. But what is really happening with me and what I'm noticing is there's far more opportunity now, concrete, viable opportunity than has ever been. And it's not just me. It's not just me. It's everyone that I know. And it's everyone that even gets in contact with me. So it's not a net result necessarily, although it helps, of being an entrepreneur for so many years and building so many relationships and learning so much and experience. It's not just that. Now, even those that have no experience and have no understanding of, of entrepreneurship or business building, they have access to opportunities. I'm sure you can take an inventory right now. Think about what are viable things that you can do to earn money. I'm sure you can find what those things are right now. Based on all these discussions that you have, you, you know, we've been talking about all kinds of ways to identify opportunities. You'll find a list of them. And all you got to do is take action. All you got to do is apply what we're learning. And you don't have to be perfect, but you'll get better. But if you do nothing, then nothing is going to happen. Comprehensiveness. Comprehensiveness is the quality of mind that enables a man to deal with a large number of related details to grasp them in their entirety, along with the singular principle which governs them and binds them together. It is a masterly quality giving organization and governing power and is developed by systematic attention to details. It's important to not lose sight of the big picture and hold the polarizing thought of valuing attention to detail. Okay, both is important. If you lose sight of the big picture, then you get caught up in all these details and doing work that masquerades as accomplishment. If you get too caught up in the big picture, then you're going to become very esoteric and ungrounded, not practical. So it's important to value both. Both are important. And over here, what we're talking about is comprehensiveness, Okay, valuing it. Some entrepreneurs don't like it. Well, if it's not who you are and you don't want to do it, it's important to work with somebody that can do it. And they can help put in the systems and tools and everything in place. So we're talking about systems here. To make your business run like a machine, provided that's what you want to do. But if you don't do it at all, then things will fall apart. Next is sympathy, fifth pillar. Sympathy is a deep, silent, inexpressible tenderness 
which is shown in a consistently self-forgetting, gentle character. Sympathetic people are not gushing, but are permanently self-restrained, firm, quiet, unassuming, and gracious. Lack of sympathy arises in egotism. Sympathy arises in love. Okay? Another one of the higher states of consciousness is unconditional love. Okay, not I love you, and if you don't do this to me, I don't love you anymore. Unconditional. You, you love, you express, you share, you care, because that's who you are. That's a higher state of consciousness. That's what we're talking about here. Egotism is involved in ignorance. Love is allied to knowledge. A lot of knowledge is available to the person. Okay, very, very few people operate from a perspective of unconditional love. And even if they do, they don't do it all the time. And those that have access to unconditional love can recognize that at that level of consciousness, there's more knowledge available, different kinds of knowledge. Einstein always said this. You can't solve the problem in the state in which you create it. And thus, when you raise up, you level up your consciousness into a place of unconditional love, you get access to even more profound knowledge. How do you think that Napoleon Hill was able to gather the knowledge that he shares? How do you think that James Allen was able to gather this knowledge? They raised their consciousness and they got access to this knowledge. This knowledge was within them. Yes, Napoleon Hill was sanctioned by Andrew Carnegie and you know he was stimulated by those, but he reflected within to recognize if it was true or not. And as a result, he became... And as a result of becoming, the impact of what he did lived on through many years. Look, how many years have gone by? We're still talking about Think and Grow Rich. How many people were influenced by Think and Grow Rich? I did almost a three-hour video on Think and Grow Rich because it's a powerful book, because it's a transformative book. It was a book that changed my life. It was a book that raised up my consciousness. Beyond the, tr beyond the material results came something even more profound opening into higher spiritual realms. The discovery of books and realizations found in Autobiography of the Yogi, Becoming My Own Best Friend, a book that I did a discussion on. All that started in that journey, higher levels of consciousness. Fourfold are qualities which make up the great virtue of sympathy, namely, number one, kindness. Kindness, when fully developed, is not a passing impulse, but a permanent quality. That means you're kind to everybody unconditionally. The people in the store, when you go to the store, when you're lining up at a cash out, you're kind to everybody. You're kind to the wait staff and the waitresses. You're kind to everyone regardless of who they are and where they come from and what they believe in and their choice of how they want to live reality. You're kind to them because it's an unconditional act. It's unconditional. You know you're not being unconditional when you're kind to someone, they don't reciprocate, and that makes you feel bad. Why does it make you feel bad? It's because you're conditional. You're seeking approval. You're seeking validation. You don't need validation or approval to be kind. Be kind. A true kindness is unchangeable and needs no external stimulus to force it into action. It's who you are. How do you think a person, we're talking about prosperity here, how do you think a person who is unconditionally kind experience, experiences reality? Maybe you haven't met anyone like this, but I've met a bunch of people that, you know, sometimes they're not kind. They're human. They make mistakes. But a lot of times they're unconditionally kind when they're in this certain frequency, when they raise up their consciousness and so forth. They attract far more opportunity than anybody else. They attract more sales, sales reps who are kind. If you want to get good at selling, Infuse in yourself that kindness and authenticity based on consultative selling. Now, my kind of selling is consultative selling. And that is listening, and it's almost therapeutic for your prospect. It is therapeutic for your prospect because you listen so deeply. You care so deeply, even if they buy or not. You do it anyways. Why? How does it help you? What if they don't buy? Well, it doesn't matter. It's an exercise. It's unconditional. If they don't buy, they refer you to somebody. A lot of times that's true. If you're a person that's kind to one person and then somebody else comes by and you're not kind to them, now granted, you only have a certain amount of energy 
and we can't be so you know conversational with absolutely everyone that would be impossible but we can be more gracious we can be kinder and we can say stuff like if you can't communicate with someone i apologize i can't talk right now i'm just involved with this all kinds of ways i'm not going to get into the nuanced details but it's an energy it's more about the energy and the other person you can feel it and it's an exercise because you get better at it you're going to see it's not easy to always be kind all the time but it's worth it to practice it a true kindness is unchangeable and needs no external stimulus to force it into action generosity generosity goes with a larger hearted kindness it's kindness be the gentle sister if kindness is the gentle sister generosity is the strong brother a free open hand a magnanimous character is always attractive and influential one of the things that one of the ways that i am and i talk to a lot of people about this is is when i'm hanging out with friends or if i'm hanging out with business partners or we're doing a business deal or wherever we are i'm always going to be generous with my energy and it's going to appear that i've got all the time in the world and i set myself up to be like that because i never wanted to be that person because i've experienced it many time before where they think they're more important than the person that they're communicating with and their time is more valuable so they act and they even say i'm busy and i can't get back to you and all these different kinds of things that implies at a nuance level it's is about nuance as well that they don't respect and it's a sign of not respecting themselves so generosity goes beyond just resourceful generosity in the sense of money giving away but it's happiness joy abundance and feeling giving away okay making people feel like you were the most important or they were the most important person in your life that's the goal is with everybody that you communicate with regardless you make them feel that you think about them all the time they are the most important person they have to feel that okay something happens when they feel it you can't make them think it and yes it involves more presence of mind to do something like this yes it involves more work but we already talked about this earlier what do you want do you want success do you want prosperity or do you want to be lazy okay this stuff takes work but it's also joyous it's also fun because it's an amazing experience to have a conversation with someone to do a business deal with someone in which they enjoy it and you get to mutually share the enjoyment of that experience it makes everything that much more worthwhile number 3 is gentleness gentleness is akin to divinity perhaps no quality is so far removed from all that is of is coarse brutal and selfish as gentleness so that one is becoming gentle he is becoming divine he can only be it can only be acquired after much experience and through great self discipline cuz think about this for a moment when you're dealing with somebody that's difficult a lot of us might find it hard to stay gentle we talked about this in pitch anything okay that video frame control whoever owns the frame dominates the interaction essentially controls the interaction if you don't know what i'm talking about watch that video i'll put a link in the description learn about frame control and frame control is not harsh it can be someone has frame control can enforce a harsh frame but that's not what we're talking about here someone who's congruent in gentleness will own a gentle frame okay and who doesn't want to be part of that frame do you want to be a part of a frame where someone is just a jerk really at the end of the day do you want to be part of that frame do you think people will want to be around you when you're like that well maybe if they're insecure they'll want to be around you or do you raise yourself up to a higher level of consciousness and you are gentle in the ways that you are and you practice that every time wherever you go even when you're driving down the street and if someone cuts you off observe how you respond train yourself to be more gentle hold yourself to a higher standard and others will respond accordingly otherwise they won't want to participate with you people who are really gentle attract gentle people i speak from experience the more i was raising up my ability to consciously practice being gentle 
the more I would attract people that are gentle. And interestingly enough, I've attracted some people who might not even be gentle with other people, but they're gentle with me. Because we're talking about frame control here. In the awareness of you, if you're a gentle person, they will start to bring out their gentleness because it's going to be kind of awkward if they're going to be rude when you're being gentle. It just like I'm talking unconditional gentle here, not conditional gentleness. Insight, number four. Insight is the gift of sympathy. The sympathetic mind is the profoundly perceiving mind. We understand by experience and not by argument. Okay, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Really accept people for who, you, who they are. One of the sk uh, skills that I've cultivated over the years is I enjoy hanging around with people that don't see reality the way that I do, have totally different belief systems that I do. And I just seek to understand. I'm not there to change their mind. I just want to understand. Now, interestingly enough, they always end up asking me my opinion on things, and they might even a lot of times get influenced. But that's not my goal. My goal is just to understand. And the understanding raises the consciousness. It, it, because depending on how polarizing their viewpoints are, they might not have a lot of people that really want to hear them out. And when you become that person, you will attract some really interesting people. I can just think of it like, as I started raising this up, the kind of interesting people that I attracted. They share with me all kinds of things that they're involved with and things that they do. And I just get so fascinated by the reality that they've chosen to live. And I accept them. I might not necessarily agree with what they're doing. I wouldn't necessarily do what they're doing, but I have enough self-esteem and self-confidence cultivated. And again, this is grounded in purposefulness that I'm not going to get swaying off path. So what they're doing is they're further dimensionalizing my understandings. They're giving me knowledge that I would not have access to if I did not allow myself to be open. See, people are afraid to be open because they feel that they're going to be influencing and get pulled down in the wrong path. That will only happen to you when you have a lower self-esteem, a low, you don't have a high self-esteem. I can tell when somebody has a high self-esteem based on their level, level of genuineness, their openness and their communication, their realness, they're keeping it real, okay? Because they don't have time to play games and things like that. Look, if you play games and you do manipulation, you're going to find people to manipulate, of course. That's going to happen. I'm not interested in stuff like that. And the reason why I'm not interested in stuff like that is because of these principles we're talking about here. Calmness of mind, being kind, gentleness. How can you, how can you live those principles? Unless you treat others with respect. And how can you respect others if you can't respect their viewpoint and how they see reality? Just respect it. There's a difference, the nuance difference. Don't have to agree with it and say, I'm going to do it. But show them some respect, and they will appreciate you like you wouldn't believe, and they will be on your side like you wouldn't believe, because nobody really treats them like that. It's a great exercise. I recommend doing it. Connect with people that don't see reality the way you do. Connect with people in all walks of life. And don't try to enforce your ways on them. Not at all. Just understand and watch your mind expand. Watch how it reveals your strengths, weaknesses, insecurities. Hold the stretch and embrace what they're saying and understand. And you will transform and you will integrate insights, perspectives, and truths that they have experienced based on what they have done. And it will further your purpose. Because if you're purposeful, everybody that you attract in your life is helping you achieve your purpose. They're revealing to you about yourself. They're revealing to you about how reality works. And so important point here. Prejudice is the great barrier to sympathy and knowledge. Okay, prejudice is the great barrier to sympathy and knowledge. Higher states of consciousness, acceptance, acceptance of others. It is impossible to understand those against whom one harbors a prejudice. We only see men and things as they are when we divest our minds of partial judgments. We become seers as we become sympathizers. Sympathy has knowledge for her companion. Now, again, nuance point. When you're sympathetic, it doesn't mean you're taking in their energy. If you do it right with practice, you won't take in their energy. 
Okay, it's a difference. Now think about that. We can get deeper into it, and perhaps I will in one of the upcoming videos. Sincerity. Human society is held together by its sincerity. A universal falseness would beget a universal mistrust, which would bring about a universal separation, if not destruction. Life is made sane, wholesome, and happy by our deep-rooted belief in one another. If we did not trust men, we could not transact with, with them could not even associate with them. Okay, so if we don't trust others, we couldn't transact with them because we wouldn't have that trust. And since you attract who you are, if you become trustworthy, you'll start noticing how you attract and do transactions and business deals and partnerships and friendships and relationships with people that are. It all starts with you. You attract who you are. You don't get what you want you get what you are. Four beautiful traits adorn the mind of the sincere man. They are, number one, simplicity. Simplicity is naturalness. It's a simple being without fake or foreign adornment. One of the reasons why I'm a huge fan of minimalism, and I talk about this all the time, is because I like to focus on what's important to me and my purpose and my contribution to others. And that gives me clarity of mind and that allows me to serve others better and it's simple but it's not cheap it's not weak it's actually from a place of power a higher level of consciousness power because it increases my focus and there's something pure about it there's something very gracious about it there's something very peaceful about it but it's not just that feeling but what I can do as a result of that simplicity, the impact that I can have. So it's important to recognize, where are we making our life complex? Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual even. Why are we complicating things? Are we doing it to hide from something? A lot of times I find that those that have a hard time simplifying keep themselves in a perpetual loop of busyness as a form of avoidance of facing the real issues. As Carl Jung said, very important. We don't become enlightened beings by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. And one of the ways that we do not make the darkness conscious is by making things complicated. Number two is attractiveness. Attractiveness is the direct outcome of simplicity. This is seen in the attractiveness of all natural objects, to which we have referred, but in human nature, it is manifested as personal influence. Real attractiveness comes from a place of simplicity. Its core components are broadcasted outwards and heightened by the different things that we use maybe externally the way we dress, the way we carry ourselves, the way we present ourselves, our communication style, to translate into another person as attractiveness. And those that are very simplistic and powerful often don't even have to really say much, don't really have to even do much. They just attract. You'll notice this. And again, we have to value both simplicity and complexity. So what we're saying here is not, okay, just simplify everything by just getting rid of stuff. No. There's a value and appreciation for complexity that needs to be occurred to get properly simplistic. There's a saying, only a few things matter about anything. I learned that quote from a 10-minute talk that Darren Hardy did a while back. I'll put a link in the description if I can find that. And he talked about a very successful person who got to a really high level and the greatest piece of advice that they could transfer over to the generations was that. Only a few things matter about anything. Like really reflect upon it and watch or listen to that audio. If I find it, I'll put it in there. But it's not just based on just not understanding and valuing complexity. This was a very intelligent person who had a lot of complexity in their life. But what we're talking about is the informational hierarchy. Now, this is something that I cover a lot in my mind map training program. And this is why I'm able to take concepts 
and break it down in a way that's simplistic, but I get into a lengthy discussion on complexity going back and forth between complexity and simplicity. And so both is important, but it depends on what we're doing. The answer is it depends. Penetration. Penetration along to the sincere. Penetration belongs to the sincere. All shams are unveiled in their presence. All stimulators are transparent to the searching eye of the sincere man. When one clear glance he sees through all their flimsy pretenses, tricksters with under his strong gaze and want to get away with him. He who has rid his heart of all falseness and entertains only that which is true has gained the power to distinguish the false from the true in others. He is not deceived. Who is not self-deceived. If you want to be able to read others really well, I always talk about that. It's so important to read, to understand who you're dealing with, to look beyond the facade of what's being presented, to understand the depths and nuances of someone's character and the personality and who they are and what they're capable of. It's important to be able to read them really well. But in order to be able to see that clearly, you have to be a person of principles because that's where you're going to be able to see them from. Those are your perspectives. That's what you're going to weigh it up against. And you're going to be able to see even the subtle gestures, the subtle movements, the subtle actions, the reactions to what you say and how they are and how they respond, what they're capable of doing, both positive and negative. And if you want to be able to have this kind of level, we have to create a level of clarity and purity and simplicity within ourselves. And he says it, how so, right here. Rid his heart of all falseness and only entertains, and entertains only that which is true. That's how you can distinguish. And you get better and better with practice. Now, how do you think this helps you in the world of business? Well, I'm sure you might have already thought of this as I said that. The clearer you are, on how to read people and know whose intent is pure and who's not and who's actually maybe going to do something for you in the short term and turns into a win, but they're going to mess you over in the long term. The better you get at this, the better you are at finding the ideal prospects, the ideal joint venture partners, and the better those deals end up going through. A lot of times you'll find, and I'll speak to some experience, if you get good at doing this, the deals are handshake deals because you don't need to do, and I'm not advising that you don't you know, look after legal stuff. That's also very important. But one of the things I'll, I'll say is that when you're dealing with people of integrity, because you are of a person of integrity, there's a certain level of trust and care and responsibility that's assumed by both parties and respect for each other. Power. Power goes with penetration, and understanding of the nature of actions is accompanied with the power to meet and deal with all actions in the right and best way. Now we can talk more about power, but we did a long discussion, a deep discussion on power versus force. And if you haven't watched that video, you got to watch it. Because the important distinction there is that power and force are not connected at higher states of consciousness. Most people think power is associated with force physical force, mental force, emotional force. It is not, only in lower states of consciousness. In higher states of consciousness, it's associated with abundance. It's a personal power. It doesn't require you to take power away from another person. You get everything you want. You achieve everything you want. You realize and recognize and appreciate abundance, and you are around people that share that abundance. You don't want to control them, and they don't want to control you. You enjoy each other's company. You share, you reflect, and you work together in a very harmonious way. That's achieved in the higher states of consciousness. And going back to opportunities, the best of the best opportunities exist in the higher states of consciousness. Impartiality. To get rid of prejudice is a great achievement. Prejudices, piles, obstacles in a man's way, obstacles to health, successes, happiness, prosperity, so that he's continually running up against imaginary enemies who, when prejudice is removed, are seen to be a friend. 
Now, this is what we do. We go around projecting into reality what we believe. We dislike someone and we physically think it's the other person rather than going within ourselves and making peace within ourselves and recognizing that the enemy is within. It's the ego. Okay, I did a discussion on this book, Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday. The enemy is within ourselves. And when you project hatred over to another person, recognize, sit down and take the personal development exercise of recognizing what you're doing that thing in some shape or form. The four great elements of impartiality are, number one, justice. The just man does not try to gain an advantage. He considers the true value of things and molds his transactions in accordance therewithin. So here's what I'm bringing to the table. What are you bringing to the table? Okay, that's fair. Let's do it. If not, I don't, I don't want to do this deal. And in order to do this deal, maybe you can add this. And if the other person says, well, I don't feel it's comfortable to add the other thing, I'll say, okay, then perhaps it's better not to do the deal. Nothing against you, nothing against this. But what I'm looking for is working with these resources that I have. And I'm looking for somebody that has those resources that I'm looking for. And I believe that with my resources and your resources, we can put this deal together. That's how most of my conversations go when I'm doing my business deal. There is no emotion. There's no trying to get the upper hand or anything like that. Because as soon as I sense that, I walk out of the room. I'm not interested in that. Not disrespectfully walk out of the room, but I don't want any part in that because why? I can find more than enough people that will deal the fair way. And sometimes I meet people that have never been dealt with that way. And they find it so refreshing and they become partners for life. They appreciate that and they hold themselves up to a higher standard. See, one of the things that we do when we go on this journey is we level ourselves up and we level up other people. As an entrepreneur, as a business person, when you level up, it's not your full something you got to work so hard to do, but you'll notice that you'll take responsibility for leveling other people up if they're ready to be leveled up. Now, again, acceptance. If somebody doesn't bring to the table a fair share of what is going to be needed for the deal, then I accept them. I'm not looking for that. Okay, so what I'm looking for is, the, now, do they accept me? I don't know. But if they don't accept me, they got to question themselves and ask why not. If they do accept me, then respect. We go our separate ways. The upright man purges his business of all bargaining and builds it one the more dignified basis of justice. He supplies a good article at the fair price, the right price, and he does not alter. He does not soil his hands with any business which is tainted with fraud. His goods are genuine and they're properly priced. If your value is high, you can charge more. You can charge a premium. If your value is not that high and you, charge, you try to charge a premium, you're probably not going to get it. Oh, you're probably going to find somebody that's going to want to be taken advantage of and they're just going to come back to you later and say that you took advantage of them. What's the point of that? Why not raise up the value so that you could raise up the price? We all want to make more money. Yes. The way to make more money, we've talked about this many times, is by raising value. And if you're not making the money, then you're not raising the value. And it's not what you think is valuable. It's what people are willing to pay for. A lot of times, when you raise up the value, what will happen, you concentrate on raising up the value, you'll offer a higher price that you've never offered before, and people will be like, wow, that's it? In other words, you're worth even more than that because you are focusing on raising value. Raising the price up won't be a problem. That won't be a problem at all. Focus on creating more value for others, what value means for others. And then you'll know it. You'll know if it's fair. You'll know when you're trying to manipulate and when you're not. And when you tune yourself to that understanding, you'll price fairly. You know, some consultants charge $100,000 a day. I've heard of a consultant that charges a million dollars, high-level management consultant, for a client a year. Other management consultants maybe make 100000 on being on site, working eight hours a day, whereas this person makes a million dollars plus and doesn't spend that much time on client site. Maybe puts in maybe 10, 20, 30 hours. Every few months. If that. Why? Because of his level of expertise. And the level of expertise required to optimize the business to that level that the company requires. And the company is also doing a high, high volume. We have to understand something. Some companies are doing 
tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. It's nothing to pay a million dollars to a management consultant that's going to optimize their business to bring in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars as a result of their expertise. Now, it's a personal choice. You know, if you want to play there, if you don't want to play there, it's a personal choice. And that's what we have to really recognize, that value is based on what we can create as far as concrete, tangible results, not hypothetical results. We've got to be able to calculate the return on investment. Again, that's all business topics, but that's what we're talking about here. Number two is patience. Patience is the brightest jewel in the character of the impartial man. A man must begin to wisely control himself and to learn the beautiful lessons of patience if he is to be highly prosperous. He is to be a man of use and power. He must learn to think of others, to act for their good, and not alone himself, to be considerate, forbearing, and long-suffering. Okay, so this is the thing. We're going to go through hardships in life. That's just how it works. And that's how we cultivate patience. Patience is a virtue. We've heard this said many times. We have to look for opportunities to cultivate patience. And in that, not be resentful for the lessons. Although it'll be tough and we might feel that and that's okay. But are we running away from situations in our life that are opportunities to cultivate patience? Calmness. Calmness accompanies patience. It is a great and glorious quality. It is a peaceful heaven of emancipated souls after their long wanderings on the tempest river ocean of passion. It makes the man who has suffered much endure much, experience much, and has finally conquered. It makes a man who has suffered much, endured much, experienced much, and has finally conquered. That's when you get calm. And I also believe it's an ongoing journey. You can increase the level of calmness. But you know you've gotten to a certain level of real calmness when you find yourself in challenging situations that were once situations that would throw you or balance all off and you would feel chaos. But you say, yeah, we'll figure this out. It's going to work out. Yeah, we can do this. You know, a couple of things. I mean, I don't know the answers right now, but here's some things we can try. And then when we try it, we're going to get some responses. And based on those responses, we'll adjust accordingly. Number four is wisdom. Wisdom abides with the impartial man. His counsel guides him. His, her wings shield him. She leads him along pleasant ways to happy destinations. The understanding mind needs no external support. It stands on itself on the firm ground of knowledge, not book knowledge, but ripened knowledge. It has passed through all minds and, through, and therefore knows them. It has traveled with all hearts and knows their journey in joy and sorrow. Wisdom, again the theme, comes through applying what you're learning, experiencing, having reference experiences, and being diligent in your practice, tracking, analyzing, figuring out how to optimize. That's how you gain wisdom. Placing yourself in challenging scenarios in which you grow. Seek to understand people and see their view of reality and appreciate them. The eighth pillar, self-reliance. If we rely upon the light of another, darkness will take upon us. Darkness will overtake us. But if we rely upon our own light, we have but to keep it burning. In earlier stages of life, we're looking for others to support us, to help us. Some of us go into adult lives and still want support into others. And while there are others that, you know, don't really have the resources or mental capacity or physical injuries and so forth that need and re need to rely on people. That does exist. What we're really focusing on here is those that are able to be self-reliant and that we can cultivate the self-reliance. The book that I did, discussion on how to be your own best friend, Yogananda's book, Autobiography of the Yogi, great books to read and really reflect upon and understand that the power is within yourself. And to be really valuable to others, we cannot be those individuals that seek approval and validation from others. Those at a high level will feel like you're clawing onto them, like you're taking their energy and they're not going to want to be around you, which is going to reduce your opportunities. So as we're rising up to prosperity, since we're talking about prosperity here, we have to recognize and appreciate being self-reliant, not being dependent on others. Instead, looking at it from a perspective of sharing with others, enjoying with others. 
The four grand qualities of self-reliance are number one, decision. Decision makes a strong man. The wearer is the weakling. A man who is to play a speaking part, however small, in the drama of life must be decisive and know what he is about. Practice making decisions. Okay, if you have a hard time making decisions, then prosperity is a lot further away than you think. We got to be able to make decisions. You're not always going to make the perfect decision. What is the perfect decision? Even if you make a decision and it gets you the result you want, there's probably another decision you could have made that could have gotten you a better result. Or you might not happy, be happy getting the result that you want because you thought you were going to get that happiness. But another decision could have gotten you something that would be true happiness. But the bottom line is this. Decisions need to be made. And we need to get better at making decisions. And we need to get faster at making decisions. Which brings us to our next point. Steadfastness. Steadfastness fastness arises in the mind that is quick to decide. It is indeed a final decision upon the best course of conduct and the best path in life. A man without fixed principles will not accomplish much. So how do you get good at making decisions and how do you develop that steadfastness? Well, you got to have some principles in life. Okay, read a book like Principles by Ray Dalio. I did a discussion on it. I'll put a link in the description. That particular book has got some very sound principles in there. Broaden my perspectives and contributor to my own principles in life. And reading a book like that can really help you identify your own principles to live by. And if you don't have principles that you live by right now, then a lot of times you're going to have a hard time making decisions. I see this universally. In those that can't make decisions, they have a hard time. They don't have principles because the principles allow you to evaluate your opportunities, the possibilities, and you make decisions accordingly. Number three is dignity. Dignity clothes, as with a majestic garment, the steadfast mind. The man of dignity cannot be downtrodden and enslaved because he has ceased to tread upon and enslave himself. He at once disarms with a look, a word, a wise and suggestive silence, any attempt to demean him. So we're talking about self-respect here and having self-worth. And one of my things, and you know, I'm very adamant about this thing, not in a forceful way, but just in a this is how I want it type of way, is that I'm not going to end up in an environment or a situation where I feel demeaned. I will not do that to myself. I will not disrespect myself like that because by disrespecting myself like that, I'm going to absorb the disrespecting energy and I'm going to transfer that over to my friends, my clients. I'm going to transfer it through this video. What kind of service am I being to you if I do that? So to demean myself not only means demeaning me as an individual, but those that I serve, those that I have a responsibility for. I see what I do as a responsibility, and I enjoy this responsibility. I'm blessed to have this responsibility, but it's a responsibility that I have to take with a certain level of seriousness, and I will not accept somebody demeaning me or putting me in a situation where I'm disrespected because I know this is a fact, is if people go around trying to disrespect me or anybody, what they're really doing is they're just playing themselves. They're just disrespecting themselves, and it just reveals their level of self-esteem. I'm not interested in being around people that don't have a high level of self-worth and self-respect uh, unless, unless they're looking to raise it up. And if they're looking to raise it up, then they wouldn't do it in a way where it would demean you. Independence, number four. Independence is the bright birthright of the strong and well-controlled man. All men love and strive for liberty. All men aspire to some sort of freedom. The goal is to recognize where you are finding yourself in situations where there are strings attached. And attached to those strings are things you don't want. What you'll find is that that is a result of not having a certain level of respect for yourself. Not raising your standards. Not being clear. When you do operate from a place of lack of clarity, you'll find yourself in more situations where there are strings attached. And then when it doesn't work out your way, what you're going to do is blame the other person. Now, if you're doing that, or if you've done that before, understand that that's what you did and do the best with what you can right now. Because in life, it would be great if we were integrated from birth with all these principles and everything else we talk about, but it's not like how it is. 
we learn through this journey. That's one of the exciting things about this journey. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to fall. It's okay to end up in scenarios. And the best way to handle situations like that after it happens is to reflect and recognize how you ended up in that situation. And take responsibility for that. Don't expect others to do that for you. And when you do that, you'll recognize the truth that you really do become what you think about because the recognition of those different elements will allow you to think critically, will allow you to think about what you need to think about when you find yourself in various opportunities, in various situations, in various interactions with people. And that proper thinking is going to govern your emotions and your actions and your habits, which will lead to your success. Hope you enjoyed this video. Put a link in the description to the mind map. Thank you very much for watching. I will talk to you soon. Take care.